I'm Courtney. Hi. Did I say that? I say that right into the mic. This is my friend Steve. We've got we've got Steve because this session was originally supposed to be me and Kate Barfo Barfolomaeva, who is on the communications working group, and she couldn't come at the last minute. Kate is an expert in social media, particularly. She's a she's she can build an influencer campaign. She knows the up to the minute ins and outs of how to leverage social media. That is not my area of expertise. So I had to quickly, quickly, quickly pivot to something I can talk about. So I do brand identity, I do brand strategy, communication strategy, CEO communication. So I'm kind of a big picture storyteller. So I had to pitch it that way. Didn't want to do it myself. Brought my pet, Steve, <laughs> to come and help me. So he has one section, don't worry. But just, just to, because I, I want to talk about stories and you'll see why. But so, so to get started, the first thing I need to know, whoops, I gotta hold it up here, don't I? Raise your hand if you are, you're either in marketing or you are, you know, in some way employed in the world of actual storytelling, marketing, that kind of thing. Like it's a thing you do. Hi, I'm gonna be able to see. Boris, you are, huh? <laughs> Okay. Okay. That's good. That's good. That, having to do it. Yeah. So I, the reason why I asked is, yeah, I guess you will. So the reason I asked is that if you kind of already are a storyteller, there's two ways that this is going to apply to you. One is telling the story about sort of OSM stories is a little funky and fun because it's different. So it should still be helpful. And then also we are going to have a workshop element. So I might, those of you who are writers, I might even ask you to help with that, depending on how this goes. Because again, I just, I mean, we, I made this up until the last minute. Okay, so I don't even think I have to move my slide to ask my next question, which is what is a story? Audience participation, what makes something a story? What? A plot, okay. What's a plot? An event, okay. When something changes? Theoretically, beginning, middle, end, yep. Good point. Reports have beginning, middles, and ends, good. Plot, conflict where? Say again? Reason to care, now we're getting there, keep going. Character definition, i.e. a person, or something that makes us care about a person. Anything else? point of view. That's starting to be like grad school English, but yes. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. So, okay. So, because I, the reason why I asked that is because, what? Ah, I, I gesticulate too much. It's going to be a problem. Um, okay. So I wanted to distill what a story is down to four. We're going to talk about the first two first. As Guillaume said, something that has a beginning, middle, and end, it can just be a report. And that, and Honestly, that is the crime that is committed against a lot of us in, in this world, right? Because people tell you something and they start at the beginning and they tell you all the details and then they end and you have either died of boredom or something similar by then, right? So there's another way to arrange a story. And the first thing that you need to do, some, somebody I think said con plot or conflict or something. The first thing is, is what's the problem? That's really, that's a really important question that doesn't get asked actually. What? There's, there's always a problem to be solved. And now it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be a sad problem. It could be, I really need more chocolate. That's my problem. I got to find the problem, you know, I, I'm, and I'm going to rob a candy store, right? Like it's not, it doesn't mean problem in the negative sense. It means something to solve. And I think this room will get that. This room gets, I think this room likes to solve things. So, so that's number one. And don't forget it because we're coming back to it. Second one to Elisa's point, who has to come to the rescue? It's, it's, I mean, it's either going to be a robot or a person, right? So who? You always have a main character. You always have a protagonist. Okay, so then the last two are, what are the interesting details? This is the one that we also missed. And what's the happy outcome? Hopefully happy outcome. Now there are stories that don't, but we're going to only have happy endings today. So I just wanted to just give you that basic thing because it's kind of magic, honestly. 
So if you're somebody like me and you get a briefing with an engineer who are amazing humans, um, and, and they tell me, they tell me the beginning, middle, end of whatever it is, and I say, well, what, what's the problem that we're solving? And that can be a hard question, right? So, and, and, and it goes all the way to, you know, like who, who, what is the rescue? So it's this, I just want to impress this upon you that this is a useful simplification of a story. And you can have a whole like hero's journey and there's all kinds of things to do with stories. But if you get these four, you're going to, you're going to, it's going to be good. And it's surprisingly difficult. Okay. So today we're going to talk about what's a story. We're going to talk about the origin story. Then we're going to talk about what some of the stories I see in OSM, because I think that's a unique point of view I bring. I think I see things because I'm actually not super close to the project itself. I kind of see it from the lens of an English major. Where to tell your story and then really quick, well, not really quick, hopefully we'll have time to, to workshop some of your stories. That would be the dream. So, okay, we're gonna do a little more of what's a story. Is this a story? And if so, what are the four things? I can cold call someone if we need it. <laughs> what's the what's the problem? There's no one that wants lighthouses as a job anymore. That's the problem. No one to uh, watch the lighthouse and put the fire on. I mean, I think that is a problem, but just from this picture alone is what's the problem. Is there a problem being solved here? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, what one answer is it, it was interesting to the person and they wanted to solve that problem. I, I But I do think out here was was the other answer, which is, the, the problem being solved here is let there be light, right? The, the problem is we are in darkness, and if we don't have lighthouses, it's sad. <laughs> and and so this, and, that, and that's why I'm saying, like, these things can be subtle and implied, but why do I even care that there are lighthouses in Ireland? Well, because I care that there are lighthouses. So, and then the who is the person who made it, right? And then the details for me are where they are. And then for me, and because we're mappers, Another, to me, really important detail is you begin to see the outline of the, the land, right? And I think that's such an interesting thing in all of these maps where we look at light. Um, and then the problem solved is now we know where the lighthouse is in Ireland. And so it is a story. It, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a stretch. I think if you really wanted it to grab people, you might do, you'd show what would happen if you didn't have lighthouses, but it's, it's a story. Okay, is this a story? And this is an honest question, because it might be, and I just don't know it. <laughs> so um, yeah, tell me what you guys see. What part is there? Like, it, like you said, it, uh, there might be a story, it's just a narrative. Um, yeah, there could be a story of what happened in the last few years after the <laughs> Yeah. Illustrate the problem. What? Illustrate the problem. Well, I don't know why. Yeah. What was the problem? Sure, exactly. Yeah, was it missing maps? It's active in the Libya coast, maybe something is going on there. That's, that's what I was scared at. I thought, what could be something going on there? Right, right. So that's some. This is the that's the clue to the problem. And if I'd had more time, I might have dug around. But that and and this is this is the classic open street map thing, right? Because I'm guessing there's probably a cool story here. But it doesn't, it is not self-evident. It's interesting to me. I thought it might be really evident to you guys. That, so it's interesting. Even I mean, you can't see it probably really well, but a good story will take will take that and maybe say, oh, a thing happened in Libya that day, and here's how we solved it. But that this is this is lacking some of those elements. So we'll keep going, do another one. Okay, how about this one? Is this a story? What do you see? <clears throat> Sorry. The, the main character is the problem being solved. Uh, what shall the other one check this? Interesting. Yeah. Main character, it's got a problem solved, a main character, some interesting detail. 
And a happy ending. Okay, so this is by Donatar, who is on the communications working group and is really good at it. And I would really encourage you to look, follow OpenStreetMap Uganda, also follow her. She's also newly and often running both of the OpenStreetMap LinkedIn pages. Again, I encourage you to join those and follow them. She's very good at this. And look how short it is. And yet she's got us. So we've got, we know what they used. We know who, who their names are. We see them smiling. We've got a happy ending. You know, I mean, this, you can tell a really short story. You don't have to be Dostoevsky, right? So that is, that's something we're all going to work toward. I'm not, I mean, this is a hard to do. I, I can't do it. I follow what she does. I copy her. Um, okay, now I'm going to give you a before and after. So here's, we're going to, this is one option you're getting to. Which is a better story? This one of Faye? Many of you probably know Faye. And, or this story. Which do you like better? A or B? <laughs> a. Wait, which is A and which is B? I've already forgotten. <laughs> okay, this is the, no, whoops, this is A, this is B. Which one do you like? A. Right, why do we like A? We got a person, we got a smile. Also, we have a sense of action, right? Like there's definitely a, a party going on. Something's happening. I mean, and here again, the problem to be solved, the problem is that we're going to celebrate OpenStreetMap's birthday. So that's what I mean. It doesn't have to be a problem problem. This one, if you're very, very hungry, might feel really like a compelling story. But And, and this, is my own, this is my own mistake. So I put both of these photos in the, ninth, the blog post for the OpenStreetMap 19th birthday and, and left this one as the default. And I was so frustrated because the one of Faye is so good. Right. So and, and it lets me and we're not going to get too into it. But um, when we get to visual storytelling faces, human beings want to look at faces. We just do. And we all think we have to have a perfect Instagram. You don't just people love faces. OK, so this is you, Steve. You ready? OK, you can do it. OK, so. Yeah. <laughs> so back in the olden days. <laughs> Back before I was born, <laughs> um, Steve, you were, actually, I'm going to have to give you the mic. You, you're the original ambassador. You were the person who had to tell OpenStreet, like, what was the OpenStreetMap story, and you had to tell people something that didn't exist yet. And so what I wanted to ask you about was, like, how did you form, how did you form it into a story? You're just messing with data and doing, I don't even know what you were doing, but I, I know, I just know from the lore that you talked to many, many people about it, so... Speak and you summarize because otherwise we'll go back yeah. and forth. Damn, anonymous internet people. Is there, is there anyone even listening? Um, yeah, I know you guys are. Uh, right. Um, so the things that strike me um, uh, out of these slides is firstly that 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 four point narrative of what a story is can also be a loop, right? That feeds back on itself to the next problem, right? It's like watching the Avengers movie where it's just the bad guy gets bigger every time. Um, with OSM specifically, the thing that's slightly outside of there is is the uh, having a, an enemy, right? So while it was a reason, so the, the beginnings of OpenStreetMap a thousand years ago in 2004, um, the reason at some level was lack of available data in the United Kingdom because the Ordnance Survey is a government agency that uh, had an effective monopoly um, that there was no way around. And then that story was repeated in other places. But it was also extremely useful to have, an, have a, a poster child enemy that we could all gang up against, um, which is a favorite in Britain as the government is bad in some way. Um, so it's very convenient, very easy. They're a monolith, they're faceless. Um, a lot of people have a lot of uh, good emotions associated with the Ordnance Survey as well, um, because you grow up with them in the UK. It's the, their cartographic style is very well known and famous, and you use it in a bunch of contexts when you're a kid. Um, what else? What's, and then do you want me to tell the story? Well, so to summarize, so and you put that in the problem, like you had a, the, the enemy is the problem. You have to beat the enemy. So that's great. It's like Bowser, which would make me Super Mario. Yeah. But how did you? What what was the what was the thing that you were doing? What was, was the like? Oh, we're manipulating data. Did, did that really sell? Like, how did that go? 
So at the time when OSM started, Linux was taking off, right? The, the open source operating system. And people were upset primarily with Microsoft for various ideological reasons. And it was easy to take that narrative and emotion that there was this big evil group called Microsoft and we were going to free the software by making this stuff open and available. Even though it mostly didn't work back in sort of the early 2000s, it was extremely difficult to get working like it does today. Um, but it was easy to, uh, hot, what's the right word? Something like um, symbiotic or whatever a virus does to a cell, something bad where you take it over. Yeah, something like that. Epiphyte might be a good one. So. It was easy to go around to those existing groups that have already done all the hard work. So there were lots of Linux groups um, around mostly the Western world where people met a little bit like this. There were conferences just like this about Linux that were very bottom up 20 years ago. And go and do a talk about OSM. And the reason that was great for them is most of the talks were about compiling Apache web servers or something. So if you could do something that was real, and had color and it was uh, tactile, right? You could touch it. You could take all the energy behind those existing movements and redirect them a little bit. Um, and I think you see the same thing in Germany, although I've never been to one in, in the Stamtisch idea that you can run these Stamtisch that people already have Stamtisch. They already know what a Stamtisch is and then you can just sort of twist it slightly and make it about maps. So people already knew what open source software was. There was already a closed source enemy um, they were already meeting up and trying to figure out how to go build this stuff and build community. And then just uh, OSM was a, a, a good way of just latching on and redirecting that mission a little bit. And in order to get the initial, let's call it 1,000 to 10,000 people involved or something. So when I was doing that, I was doing hundreds of talks. I used to have a number on the first slide that said how many talks I would done. And I gave up after 500, I think it was, or something. It was some enormous number of talks. Um, you covered several good things. One, and we're going to get back to his audience. You found the right audience. I mean, that's huge. Um, but I want to zero in on, you said color and something. What, what's that? Because that's my thing is like, why do I care? Why do I, why do I care about your thing that's open data? So if someone speaks German in the audience, they can give the German for fingertips feel. Um, that. Right, you fingertip feel. So <laughs> the, the problem, the, not the problem, one of the many challenges of the Linux movement in the early 2000s was that they were talking a lot in the abstract, right? It was like, Microsoft is this far away thing that is bad, but we have this Linux thing, which is good. Um, and by somehow writing code, this is gonna solve the problem, but it wasn't something that you could see and touch. I couldn't throw a Linux at you, right? I mean, apart from burnt CDs or something. Um, whereas maps were inherently tactile, right? Because they're pieces of paper and we can draw them. We all know what it is. Um, so that's what I meant by the tactileness. And there's a specific term in German, which is usually used in tactical battlefield um, uh, context that denotes not just a fingertip feel like you can touch it, but that you have a deep understanding of what is happening as if you are having it in your fingers, right? Um, so you understand where all the tanks are and how they're firing at each other. And you're not just sort of oblivious and a third party actor in this. You're part of it. A little bit like these guys in this um, Dali image that I created. By the way, I hope you noticed that some of them like apparently have their legs inside the car, but. Um, <laughs> yeah. Does that make sense? It does. I, I get. I get it. Can you give me a non-battlefield example, or maybe, or maybe just tell me about a time in London when you saw people get it? You know, may, just maybe take us okay. to a moment. Yeah. Well, I can tell you one example which I've used many times before of when I got it, which was when I was doing a mapping party somewhere. And the way that you, mapping parties had their own narrative back then, right? We don't really run mapping parties like we used to because the map is sort of filled in most of the time. Um, but it used to be that we go to an area with no map data and then have to try and fill it in. Um, and the narrative with that to get people involved was to show them the map and then ask them to find something wrong, which was usually, at least back then, was not a difficult problem because there were entire roads missing and cities and so on. Um, 
And so they would instantly get a, a connection between them and the thing that they saw that was wrong because they knew that place inherently because they lived there or it was their favorite park or whatever it was. Um, and then once they'd formed that human bond with the technology, which is what Apple tries to do all the time, right? They, then you could say, okay, great. The, the park is missing. I'll show you how to add it or edit it or whatever it was. Um, and this went on relatively well for some number of years as a, as a way of engaging people uh, up until someone said, well, I want to go and look at uh, Cuba. Because you'd also have to ask them, where do you want to look, right? I wouldn't, if I can't, it's no point giving someone a map of Belgium if they're in Alaska, right? So you say the first thing is, where do you want to look? And this person wanted to look at Cuba, and before even, um, before panning and zooming over to Cuba, I just said, hey, you know, there's going to be nothing there, and we have no aerial imagery of Cuba, um, so that we should probably pick somewhere else that you know. But we went and looked anyway, and Cuba was basically done. And it was done in a way that was sort of surprising, because I think the internet was banned. I think it still is in some context or something. Computers were still banned, I think, in Cuba back then. Um, so it was sort of odd and strange that it was not only mapped, but mapped to such a detail that I remember fairly vividly the a bunch of the hospitals already being on the map and all those kind of reference points that people use, because they're not just roads, there's places that people think about. They tend not to think of turn left on Main Street. They might more often think of turn left at the petrol station or whatever. Um, does that answer your question? I feel like I'm rambling. Um, fast forward a little bit. You actually have a map, it's happening, and the Guardian calls. How do you explain it to someone who's not a mapper and isn't going to be a mapper? I'm just trying to imagine the Guardian calling me, but yes. Um, the local newspaper, <laughs> Cat Stock Up Tree. Um, I, think, I think it's the same narrative that I just gave about showing them the map and trying, the, trying to get them to make that connection to some area that was wrong, something that they knew that was was missing. That's part of it. Um, the other piece is actually going outside and doing the mapping, which is much less of a thing now than it was back then in terms of a group activity because there were mapping parties, right? So typically when people came to those kinds of things, like I think they did at the Isle of Wight in 2007, right, which is, you know, N years ago, um, you could, you made it a physical activity. And most computer stories are not physical activities, right? Um, they sit at a desk and watch some pixels or something like that. Um, so you, you create that uh, physical presence and then there's the whole lifestyle angle that often those journalists back then were very interested in who the hell are these people, right? <laughs> what motivates them what's what's their narrative right what makes them wake up in the morning or actually even worse what makes them go out in the rain like it was yesterday or today or whatever go out in the rain and collect data for free um and then put this on a website and go through all of this pain and hassle because also you have to remember that the tools were much worse back then than they are today um and so there was that whole lifestyle interest kind of angle uh that they that draws people into that story because you can you can either relate or laugh at the people doing it right so how many people went to the mapping yesterday in the rain in this room at least two yeah three i was just going to say that this this still happens and I, and i think this is this is a good segue to the next section which is how, you know, how do you make this visible both to, in, 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 there's some of your storytelling is to each other, but some of it is to, to talk, get other people into the mapping. Um, and one of them is, I like what you said, I can't quote it exactly, but it, un, unlike lots of tech, it's actually, there's a thing you can look at. You can show people what you're doing, right? This, what, whatever this German word is. Um, okay, so we're gonna keep going in the forward direction. All right, so now we're today, or closer to today, and this was super hard for me to finish this section because, I mean, yesterday I had a total meltdown because there's 7,000 stories. And, and for me, as a storyteller, as, as a reader, as a person who is new-ish to this community, I, I get kind of stressed because there's so many good stories and I don't, I, I feel like you guys know them, but the, the, the there's lots of people who would like to know them. So caveat, I just had to choose some and, and, I, and I just have to say that there could be many others that I could have chosen. This is just out of, this was a while ago, Harry Wood, I think curated a photo of a week. It's a great wiki, please find it. 
It, um, and it has all these great photos and it's a gold mine for me because they're very good storytelling photos. These are just three. We've got a Braille, uh, you know, open street map in the wild in Braille. We've got, I think this, um, this one is in, uh, this is in Serbia and I think this is in Albania. Thank you. Um, and these are just great. You know, what I like here is, again, it's that tactile thing, right? People are out. It, and and you, in every photo, you can't get a photo of someone looking up, right? Because everybody's always either looking at, at a field paper or their phone or whatever. But you can see they're doing something. And I mean, what other tech is like that, you know? So, okay. So I've got a couple samples. So these I pulled from the diaries. This guy, <laughs> I just, I love this. I love this. This was highlighted in the weekly OSM. And it read like Dickens. I don't know if you guys go to you guys. I mean, those diary things you need to go and read them. This this middle side. It was just one day when I saw a tweet showing a map of a new dis district by typo of Pyongyang, I said to myself, "Yes, damn it! Why hasn't anyone mapped the district?" And I was just like, "Go, Oliver Twist, go do it. It's so great." <laughs> um, and he did. He did. And the, in his diary, he talks about it was like really hard. It was really lonely, and he did the whole city. And this may or may not work. It's probably not going to work. Uh, so Kate made a animation of it and put it on Instagram, and it got a ton of engagement because yeah, we, can you make it play? Maybe no. <laughs> it's too bad, but you can see it on Instagram. Um, and he, and what? Uh, the Open Street Map account on Instagram. Yeah. Can you make it play? It's just he did so much work. It would be a pity. Oh, you're just going to give us Instagram. Good. But while he does that, so problem, the city wasn't mapped. The hero, I'm going to map the city. <laughs> and, and then those details, he talks about getting lonely. He talks about how many kilometers he had to go. Yeah, this, this is always what I, oh, here we go. <laughs> Here we go. And so you get that sense of the drama. You get the sense of the work. The, um, try, try the one. No, it is supposed to be, but maybe. There's another slide on the image. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Well, oh, well. Yeah. Follow OpenStreetMap on Instagram for more. <laughs> it's okay. It's all right. But yeah, I mean, this, this, yeah, you can see this. I mean, this, and this is another thing. You, visual storytelling is huge, right? You, it's much easier to see what happened when you can watch the colors fill in. Um, and that is the happy result. And, and again, if somebody had just, if somebody had just showed me the chain sets, that, that's not a story, right? And, and that's, that's just that somehow he had taught, like part of it is he gave us feelings in his, in his diary post. All right. We can just keep rocking and rolling. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, you're saying it's that's hard to do to make the everyday videos, and is it because it's hard to edit them and collect them and that sort of thing? And it's just to create them, to create them right? Oh, you have to run it back, right? See, that's I, I sense a an app idea there. Because <laughs> I'm not an engineer, so you guys could just do that, right? No, but yeah, but th that's it. And and I do know that this video that we couldn't see that came, it took her a long time to she to put it back together, you know. So and I think that is one of the challenges of telling stories about OpenStreetMap. It really is. It's just because you've already done the editing and 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 now there, and then how do you do? It? So, but then what I might say is use a couple good photos, you know, it, it, just show a before and an after. I often think of before and an after is enough with mapping. Um, but I think that's also something we can talk about. All right, here's another one. This one, obviously, I like because I'm an English major. So this person is mapping public bookcases. Do you have those? I think, are they everywhere in the world? The, the little cases that are like out in the street? Yeah, they're so cute. So, and this one I liked because I think it's a good example of the problem. So, I mean, I think this person's already interested in public bookcases, but she's got a villain, to Steve's point. Little free libraries, you have to pay $50 to register your little free library. Like, that's a crime. Like, what? It's called little free library. <laughs> and you have to pay $50. So right away, I mean, I'm like, I'm on board. That's the enemy. So she's mapping them in Minneapolis. And 
I just think that's a great story. Now, we have her on the left is her visual of where she went in the days. And that was in her diary. And I, I mean, I think it's a pretty graphic. But when I was looking for story, I went and got photos of public libraries, because I think that's also important, right? You might not know what that is. One of these is actually on my street and the others in Germany. Um, and so I think that's another thing you just keep thinking like, okay, this, you guys, I mean, I think this is stuff you guys look at all the time, but remember other people might just actually need an object of the thing that you mapped. Um, okay, next one. Okay, this is dear to my heart and you can speak up if you need to, Theo. This is a story that we needed to tell um, we still need to tell, we are telling, which is this pro it's the problem to solve is we have to have funds for OpenStreetMap. It needs money to run. Um, and I just kept saying to people, it's free to use, but it's not free to run. So we had to figure out how to tell that story because it's really, really boring to say, give us money, give us money, give us money, as everybody knows if they open Wikipedia. <laughs> you know, it's like, really, really? Um, so we came up with and are continuously coming up with we're trying to find ways to tell the story of why you should fund OpenStreetMap, what, what the money goes for. You know, somebody was just saying to me earlier, it's like, are, is it just for servers? You know, I mean, and, and maybe it is, and that's okay. But the cool thing is the servers are named for dragons. So let's make that the story, you know. Um, but here, this is Kate. Again, Kate did this graphic, and she's, she's basically giving us all the cool things about OpenStreetMap that would maybe inspire a certain demographic to give. People who are, just love the community about it and love the size of it and the data is valued at massive billions of dollars. So it's, you gotta find the, the hook, right? So that's part of the story. So that's one thing, and this is a very social media friendly one. Hopefully many of you saw it. Then, then there's another story that you tell in something like this, which is just a call to action, like, let's go. And you know, this is what you want. You want all caps. You want people to act on the story. Um, and a lot of you did, which is great. And then there's another, and this goes back to audience. This is what we make when we go to a company. It's called a case statement. And we have to make the case for what we're doing. And it's pages, this, this is actually only part of it. So this goes back to audience, you know, is, are, are you inspiring on Twitter? Are you inspiring on Mastodon? It's gonna look really different on Mastodon than on Twitter than on Instagram. Are you going to a company? Are you going, oh my God, if you're going to the government, it's gonna be 25 pages of story. Um, but all of this is, we're always saying, what, what is the problem? We have this map, it's free to everyone. You do need to pay some people. It'd be great if we had some money to invest in some things, maybe pay some bounties, X, Y, and Z. That's a problem. And then who, oh my gosh, the story of who is just phenomenal, right? It's everyone in the world. It's people working together across language, politics, religion, region. I mean, where else is that happening, right? Then what are the details? Again, endless. But for like a corporate audience, details are about money. You know, how much do we spend on servers or people's salaries or these kinds of things? How much could we spend if we had it? So it just that you're always going down that checklist of four. And one of the happy outcomes, I think, is are we up to, what are we up? I mean, it depends on who's reporting, but just broad base is at what, 110? 110, which is since August. It's not. Oh, for the whole year. Okay. And so that story is having a happy outcome. Okay. This is the part that Kate would have done, and I can only just do a tiny bit of it, which is just some of the things that will help you tell your story. Um, so don't forget your four parts, know your audience, those obvious things. I, I use a hashtag, that's a search term. We all, it, it helps. Use a hashtag that helps people find your story. Always take OpenStreetMap because then we can amplify you. You know, that stuff still matters. Another one that I don't think people know is you do need to like and comment and share other people's posts. That will help your storytelling. It doesn't matter what format you're on. It doesn't matter what channel or forum. We all kind of do our own, but if you share others or comment on others, they'll get seen and then you get seen. And I mean, that's a network effect. And again, if there was ever a community that could create a network effect, it's this one. I mean, it wouldn't even be limited to regions. So I, I would really encourage you guys to do that. It's, it might even feel weird to comment and share, but. It's, it's a way to get the message out. Um, sorry, Ben, I sound like I'm gonna cry, but it's just because I need to drink some water. Um, <laughs> I'm so moved. 
and moved by the community. All right, this is a really quick and dirty summary of some research that Marianne and I did, and you can go and see it. It's posted in my diary. Is it in your diary too? Okay, so, but I just, another thing I really want to highlight, and, and we, you could do a two-hour presentation on this, which we did. There are a lot of channels. There's a lot of places to be telling your story. And again, I'm not sure we're using them. So there's the ones where you're just communicating about your editing or whatever, right? But I don't think people understand that there are telegram groups. You can use that group to tell a story that you did and you can share it and maybe it comes out of your region. There's um, same thing with Discord. Mastodon is growing hugely fast. Um, Twitter, Reddit, all these places, there's little niche. And the thing about those, all of those is they get it to different people. One of the things we do tend to do is just post in our own ecosystem. But if you, then you're just talking to your friends. Like if you want to spread the story that might get new, new mappers in your area, get out and post somewhere that's not just map central, get out and post, I don't know, in your mom's Facebook group or something. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I don't know what it is, but you got to, we all live in a bubble and you, you've got to get out of that. Or if you want, you know, when I think about Joost, he's gone now, but you know, they're building, they kind of want to build this European coalition. If it's only talked about in sort of Belgian channels, that's not going to happen, right? Like it's, you got to get out and post across the world and try to build those connections. Um, like US Slack is really, really big. That might be a way to build connections that way. Um, and then the second one is we did a survey and it was just interesting to see who, it, like Reddit was very responsive. And I think that's a, that's a very true thing for OpenStreetMap too. And, and you wouldn't normally think, oh, that's where I would tell my story, but you absolutely should tell your story in Reddit. It's, that's a great place for it. Um, I don't even, can you guys read this? So, and also I think these are going to be up. So it's useful, you know, think about who do you want to reach? Do you want to reach college kids? Do you want to reach... Again, your mom, do you, you know, who do you want to reach? The, you know, this stuff changes really fast. And that's why Kate would kind of know what the up and coming things are. But pay attention to demographics. Maybe you want to get some older mappers or younger mappers or whatever. Push yourself to kind of go outside of your comfort zone where you, like you make your story and then you think, where am I going to put it? Put it in new places. Um, and just, again, you should post in your own language or your native language for sure. That's super important, especially in this organization. It's very important. And then also know that if it's a really global topic, probably use English, as we all know, because we're here and talking in English. And But if you are interested in communications data, go and look at our slides, because it is kind of cool to see what is. I mean, the, the headline is, is there's an insane amount of communication happening on every possible channel all over the world. It could be, it could change humankind, <laughs> honestly, if if it was studied and... And people really knew how to use it because there's so many clear connections and people working around actual shared positive projects. There's, I, I'm actually surprised it's not being studied. It's just, it's a very extraordinary thing. And that's ours. That's ours to use. So we should be using it. Um, okay, now, you guys, this is the easy part. <laughs> I, I'm not, I have to think about this. So we can either just do AMA. I think we should probably do groups. If we were small enough, people could just work, you could say your story and we could all workshop it for you, but I think we need to do groups. So taking a key from our, our guys earlier, I wanna say groups of four to six and come up with a story. Workshop someone's story and then we'll kind of come together at the end and you guys can tell us it. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, just grab six, turn around, grab maybe six people. Just one brave soul who's got something they wanna tell and just start workshopping it. Steve? Okay, kids. Okay, class. Let's quickly report out before lunchtime. <laughs> do they do that in European schools? Do you have like, do you, well, do you, but do you have group work? No. So you're joking. So you guys do group work? Okay. All right, kids, we want to hear your story. If you guys were back there not talking about stories, mm, no, that's all right. All right, all the way in the back of the room, Matthias, what's your story? 
Yeah, okay, so um, my story is a little bit about the problem that you sometimes might feel a little bit, little bit lonely when you're mapping a particular thing, especially maybe in your small town or so. But uh, one thing that occurred to me is that I was kind of starting to map uh, the special sandstone guideposts that are in my city, around the city. And at some point I forgot about it and some random other mapper, like years later, started to map them again. And I noticed it on a map, popping it up. And so we got in contact and talked about how, what tags to use, material sandstone, for example. And eventually, like our paths converged, and uh, that was the happy ending. When you get the problem, it's really good if the problem is a human one, right? Like everybody is lonely sometimes. So, and then, and then to, for for the over time for this the, it to create connection i mean that's the dream and the thing is that that's an epic beautiful story and honestly you really should just make it into a short story but it's also it could just be a really fun you could post that online and somebody else would respond to it right it, it, there's stories can take more than one form I, that might be my phone it is okay who's next Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I like to ride on bike, and 30 years ago, I, I started to use a mobile phone that used OpenStreetMap. But at first, the map was very, very bad. There's no path, no tracks, no drinking water. And I discovered that if you put in the in OpenStreetMap, later the maps in the app, they are updated. and it, it was more better to ride on bike and to find new tracks, new paths, drinking water, so whatever you need when you ride on bike. You created a more friendly community for some more people with bicycling. Yes. Nice. Nice. Excellent. That, that's it. This is it. And maybe there's some pictures of the data around that too, but it's also human beings riding their bikes with their kids. Like, it's great. Okay, one more. Uh, well, we have time for a few more. Who's next? Who's got another good one? Go. Thanks. So, so my, my story is about uh, local communities, uh, how, to, how to build a local community. So, in my, in my town, uh, I have near me, I, uh, in, a town, in, a, in the town that I work um, in, I created, uh, I tried to create many times a small community uh, open street map and I finally um, managed to get it working so uh, so it was last month uh, we we had a map a map, a map party a map. and so um, uh, five people came came in to help me uh, and so we we did a, a map party, uh, taking pictures, uh, street level imagery, uh, and uh, uh, adding details details to businesses. So it really it was really nice to see uh, people uh, uh, in my town uh, um, having the same goal as me. So we were, I was really um, so grateful to see uh, all the same people, the same interest. So for. So I hope this will be on the start of a great um, uh, of a great uh, of a, well, journey. <laughs> yes. That's great. And the happy and the happy outcome here was it people that you knew people that you that you hadn't met before. The the happy ending is that. Uh, I tried sometimes Unix, and uh, it was a fail attempt to to get it to get a small community working, and uh, with a bit a bit of uh, um, organization and and communication, we we finally managed to get some people around, and hopefully they will stick uh, stick with uh, on those farms sometimes. 
I could almost make that point five on the story is you have to keep telling the story. Uh, sometimes many times. And I, I mean, again, I think that you live that for years, right? You just keep telling the story and eventually it, it works. It, it keeps happening. One more. Okay. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> my story is different, maybe a little bit. Uh, when I traveled to Cuba in 2008, I discovered that there is no map. I used a photo of paper map on my... Okay, so so uh, I'll try to make it short. Uh, so uh, uh, we decided to, uh, to make maps available for everyone and then uh, when we saw that OpenStreetMap uh, has very good data quality, and uh, my home country, I'm originally from Belarus, it had uh, just two roads in my Nokia navigator, uh, and we decided, hey, it's not right, it should be available to everyone. So how to promote it, how to make it uh, easy to use for everyone. We started to build a Maps With Me product, we called it Maps With Me. When we renamed it to Maps Me, when we uh, sold it, then we opened the source code of it, then it was sold again, and it was screwed up, and then we decided to create organic maps. But this is the answer, what is my OSM story? Uh, the main goal of the project, it's completely free, donation-based. Uh, we're doing it in our free time for fun. We use it ourselves. <laughs> this was the reason why we forked back again our, our child, Maps Me, which was dying. But this is another story. So we want to make it the product which is very easy to use to everyone. And the problem which I see in the community, it's OpenStreetMap is great. It wouldn't be possible without it. We rely on it. And the question is how to make it better. And the answer is more people engaged. How to engage more people? Currently, honestly, OpenStreetMap is very complex to use, to update, to edit. So we decided to go from another side, from end user side, from my mother, father side. So they never knew anything about OSM, how to edit, how to what, post gray SQL, what, what do you tell? Uh, tags, what is a tag? <laughs> Jossen. Uh, so we decided to go from another side. And right now, uh, the goal number one for organic maps is to first, to teach every user about OpenStreetMap because it's number one issue right now. People writing to me, to us, to support. Hey, my house is not there. <laughs> Edit. Or this restaurant has is not there anymore. I, I Please fix it or add this address or I cannot find something. So the task number one we're trying to solve right now, we have some ideas. We need just help and support to educate users, to tell them the story about OpenStreetMap. That it exists, it's open, it's for everyone and anyone can edit it and change it. We even provide a very simple, easy, basic editor in organic maps, and uh, I've created it also in MapsMe, uh, where you can add some point features, but of course it's just the starting point. When more people know about OpenStreetMap, more people can be converted to contributors. And this is the way to grow, so if you have any ideas how to make it even easier, how to promote it, uh, we see ourselves, we always like to, to build great products and make great uh, goals. And we see someday, in some years, uh, organic maps or whatever other maps is replacing Google Maps and other maps because those are built by corpor corporations for profit, not for people. We are trying to do it for people, make it useful. And uh, uh, the only uh, possible strategy is to contribute back and spread the knowledge and teach and educate people. So if anyone has any idea, you're welcome. Our goal, again, is to replace any commercial maps, make a good to use, easy to use, simple to use map based on open data, open source data. Well, I, no, yeah. I'll take you, I'll reframe it for you. What, what you do need from this group or this topic, it's, you know, you need the user interface that's easy and all that, but you actually also need all of these stories because these stories are what are going to make people want to use that, right? And, and I think you also said something that is important, which is, I mean, yeah, if you can explain it to your mom, 
that that's a good thing. I mean, for me, it's my kids, but you know, it, it, test your story on someone who doesn't know, because then you kind of have to make sense of it. And then, and then you give them your app, your app, right? So, okay. So go forth, tell many more stories, like other people's stories, comment on their stories, join the CWG and uh, support OSM. Is there any other calls to action? No, I think we're good. Okay.